Good afternoon and welcome to CHI Design for Emergency Presentation. Before we do our formal introductions and papers, I just wanted to share with you some additional information about the format of this session. So the first part is pre-recorded. You will hear from Dr. Syra Colombo and Professor Paolo Curelli, who lead on the Design for Emergency Research Project, an open design platform that was launched in 2020 at the Center for Design Northeastern University in Boston. Design for Emergency is led by a global team of researchers now across 11 countries and SHED is delighted to be the UK lead partner for this global project. Hello and welcome to our conversation. I'm Dr. Rhiannon Jones and founding director of SHED. Hello, I'm Dr. Victoria Barker. I am a research assistant in creative economy at Coventry University and I am also the Business and Strategic Development Director for SHED, the Social Higher Education Depot. Hello, my name is Dr. Sara Colombo and uh, I'm a, an assistant professor at uh, the Andoven uh, University of Technology. Hello, I'm Paolo Ciuccarelli, I'm Professor of Design at the Art and Design Department at Northeastern University and Funding Director of the Centre for Design at the College of Art, Media and Design. So hello, welcome to this part of the presentation, which is focusing on SHED's relationship with the Design for Emergency Global Challenge Project. I'm just going to be talking to you a little bit about the background of SHED and also then um, alluding to some of the ways in which SHED Design for Emergency Project is developing and how it will be then working in partnership with Syra and Paolo. And you'll hear more from them very soon. SHED is the Social Higher Education Depot. It is also the flat pack, pop-up, mobile, art space and public venue developed entirely out of an artistic research interest into how we design dialogue. Thinking about taking the shed out of perhaps a more typical setting for it, being a back garden or an allotment and taking it to be somewhere else as an accessible, open space, not for the storage of objects, but for the storage of conversations. And from that, the playfulness around the language of a shed started to emerge, of shedding preconceptions about people and place, about how we can perhaps create and engineer a transformative space, one that not only physically transforms but also one that can perhaps transform the way we might think about something through the conversations that could take place in this space what the impact of that might become what a mobile art space that's designed for conversation on cultural social and political discourses what would that impact look like and sound like it was around thinking about how SHED could be an instigator and a facilitator. So SHED really started to encourage me to transform the way that perhaps I and others can look at and engage with dialogue about how we can use artistic practice, live workshops, performances, appearing at festivals, creating opportunities for artists to exhibit work, taking the shed on a school tour, delivering art and cultural and sport activities, hosting debates, live music events, dances, offering artists and academics opportunities for residences. All of those processes were ways of engaging with others and developing a civic discourse about people and place. SHED is centred on the belief that social practice and the idea of placemaking is defined and focused on the granular, the nuance, the local, and on our understanding of how it is formed and shaped and reshaped by people. The concept of place is therefore to be considered as something that is reshaped rather than remade or reinvented. Shed as a structure contains elements that are distributed in a way where people and the location in which it is situated help to co-create and co-design every element of that shed. We start to think about 
the play with language and how important that becomes to the design process for us. How we are talking about shed being a space of transformation, of reconfiguring, of how we think about shedding preconceptions about people and place. Those of us who work hard to run shed think of ourselves as shedders. The shed therefore represents a very important and specific series of positions and as an object it's very important to us that we think of it in terms of how it activates itself and others by offering itself as a site for cultural contact to occur. We think about it in terms of being an architectural and multi-sensory experience. We think about the qualities of space, the aesthetics of it, the way that we think of it almost in a human form of being in the world. And we think about it as how SHED takes up those positions in order to be a social action model where it is the mechanism to create social engagement and change through participation. We think of it in terms of how we design strategies to create dialogues and how we are operating within this genre of contemporary art that promotes conversation as an art form in its own right, where it activates evolving discourses that are often emancipated beyond fixed identities, institutional viewpoints and official rhetoric. So we're committed to expanding our civic agenda and strategic approach to creating and working towards improving social mobility by providing educational opportunities and access to art and design and cultural and sporting activities through SHED. So SHED therefore is a vehicle to access inspirational and educational content outside of formal organisational structures. SHED in this sense creates that community of cultural experiences because we are inclusive and open to all. It's developed a culture of curiosity and it's future focused and shares values about people and place. It looks at the world around us. It's a brave and bold space that invites conversation and reaches out to others to form partnerships for positive impact. We are delighted to now be working on a global design project. So we will be able to contribute to the global design challenge of being a space that creates new opportunities for knowledge exchange, civic engagement, innovation and research to create a new open space for discourse. But we're also one that has been able to adapt already to create configurations that have been able to operate in a COVID secure way and one which still upholds the essence of SHED about being a dialogic, reconfigurable space. We want to be able to design our emergency SHED so that we can use it as a consultation space for the UK survey that we'll be carrying out, but also as a space to platform and showcase some of the global seed designs that have been created. I believe that socially engaged practices are a way of empowering the disempowered and including the excluded. And through that, we can achieve radical and remarkable transformations. These are not quick and easy solutions to long-term problems. And the conflicts and contradictions between art and design and problem solving remain. But what's important is that we work to bridge these gaps between privileged and the non-privileged, between institutions and socially excluded individuals and groups. We need to work together to develop new and appropriate cultural and critical contexts for practices and research to be located, to keep making opportunities for civic engagement. In doing this, SHED is both a design challenge in itself but it's also a vehicle through which other configurations, designs, projects and innovations can be tested out in a public setting. It's also about how the public can be consulted 
and we can widen opportunities to engage with design and art education and practice. We need to develop new and appropriate cultural and critical dialogues so that we can talk about the urgent issues that are affecting us all. We need to be able to create safe spaces like SHARED does, where we can come together to talk, to reflect and to learn, where we can bridge the gap between higher education and our social and civic responsibilities as individuals and as academics, to be able to talk about the world around us, where we see where real need and positive change needs to happen in the way that we think about people and place. So our relationship with Syra and Paolo now, working with our other global partners on the Design for Emergency project, we hope will enable and allow us to start to test out these seed designs that have been piloted by our international colleagues, but also how we can start to capture a better understanding of the impact of the pandemic on the UK. It is a space of curiosity for play and to talk. I love shed it brings people together. We need that. Okay, so uh, Design for Emergency uh, started uh, as a as a kind of a, a small personal initiative, like you know, from the will of designers to to face uh, issues that 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 uh, emerge uh, in, in society. So uh, Sarah Colombo just you know, joined uh, the Center for Design at Northeastern, uh, more or less in that moment where the pandemic was kind of you know, exploding uh, in, in, in Europe especially and in Italy especially. You know? And by chance, we are both Italians and both the designers. And so we kind of had this, I would say natural instinctual reaction to what was happening uh, at that time. Um, you know, we were kind of stuck in our houses and, and thinking, I think, both about what, what, what we could do as designers. Uh, you know, in, in March was really, we were uh, witnessing um, the, the peak of the, of, the, of the crisis in Italy. So um, suddenly, uh, first was a was a single town, then provinces, and then regions, and then you know all Italians were in a kind of a situation that um, you know was really unprecedented, and, and nobody was kind of understanding really what was happening. So we we had this reaction that I, again I think it's kind of natural for for designers. You know you look around, you observe, you are curious, you you and then you tend to react. And that's what we did. You know let, let's do something for 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 faith for for put our competencies as designers at the service of this unprecedented situation, the condition of people that we were feeling that, you know, through friends, parents, and, and the people that we, we were uh, talking to in Italy. So the, the question was, you know, how can we, can we do something as designers with our competencies to, to prevent that was what was something was clearly a public health emergency to become something bigger, like a social emergency. You know, it was clear at that moment that it was becoming something more than just a, a hurt health emergency. And so I think what the, the intuition was that design would have been very useful in that situation. So we came up with this idea of design for emergency as, as a reaction. And we realized immediately that it was essential to be quick, to be fast, you know, to set up design processes in a very um, you know, efficient way. So we didn't wait to have you know, full control of the situation to have a very clear plan and a strategy. So we started with something that we thought was useful at the beginning, just understand, listen you know, to feelings and emotions that were arising from this condition of uh, isolation from people. And then step by step, kind of orienting the process you know, along the way uh, we created what we call now, now a, an open platform, but it wasn't really an open platform by design at the beginning. So it was just more as a, you know, using the, this design attitude to uh, to control and orient the process, you know, while it was operating. So 
now it's kind of we have this kind of diagram that uh, reflects uh, you know the the different categories and topics we identified through the listening process and the analysis we have these four steps that i will talk uh, about in, in in a minute and but you know it was wasn't really like that so these diagrams are uh like you know reflecting ex post to what we have been doing as with this um capacity i would say of design to 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 shape you know uh, the situation in a way that that makes sense for uh, for for the people so actually these are the, the topics that we were able to to extract and to you know to to touch with the analysis and the survey and you know as you can imagine they reflect more or less what we feel when we are in a certain situation so it they reflect the needs of people that emerged uh needs of information needs of connection needs of you know managing your time and the situation support entertainment even and you know all that was kind of the result of the analysis that we did as i said you know now we see that the platform divided into different four different steps but we started by listening survey. So that's what we did in Italy. And it was kind of uh, you know, impressive, the reaction of people. It seems like they really wanted to talk about that. They had this kind of uh, will of you know, expressing their feelings. Then we did, we analyzed the data that we collected um, and it was, you know, it was almost 2000 answers in a very short time. Okay. so. Basically, now, now we describe the, the process in four steps, you know, survey, meaning listening, uh, and trying to understand people's feelings, emotions, and experiences, analyzing the, the, the data that we collected through a survey, uh, starting up uh, design challenges as a way to answer to these needs that we collected, and then, you know, having this idea of making an impact through, uh, through design, so not just collecting ideas, but creating the conditions through the repository we have, giving you know, open license for, to all the ideas. Uh, we wanted to make sure that there was the possibility to, to apply those ideas, to bring those ideas, uh, to give this idea life you know, and, and bring them into the society. We created the conditions for those ideas generated by the challenge to be further developed. And so that's where the open comes in the open platform, as we call it because we wanted to, everything to be open as much as possible. Solutions published in, with open source licenses, Creative Commons licenses. We have the data that we wanted to publish as soon as possible in the you know, open format. So anyone can rework on that. But, you know, as I said, first listen, that's what designers, designers I think are uh, pretty good at. So we have two methodologies, the attitude and the approach to to understand people very quickly and to see what happens. And we did that um, trying to use something that is a, uh, I, I would say one of the strengths of Northeastern and the Center for Design where the initiative was born. Uh, so this uh, competences we have around data and, and visualization. So both for collecting data and then analyzing data, we tried to do that systematically and um, using visualization as a tool to also to share the results of the analysis. This has been done first in Italy, as I said, that was our country. And uh, but again, something very interesting was the how quick other organizations joined the initiative. So um, you know, now we have 13 countries involved. Uh, but that happened, you know, was something that we didn't drive really. So we created a condition, but then there was this will of participation that was kind of very interesting. So. We started from Italy with the survey, March the 15, as setting up a form that people could fill in, you know, through the web, and spreading it through social media, you know, the kind of uh, means we could manage at that time. And uh, yeah, in in just four days, we had 1,600 responses, and then that's what we we started the analysis phase. And then 12 countries, and now we have other countries joining. Uh, did the same, you know, afterward in, in from March to October. And now, you know, since October, we are really trying to get with a consistent analysis across all those different results. I think it's also an incredible knowledge base that we're building. But 
Now I leave the stage to Sarah for the description of the other steps of the process. Thank you, Paolo. So about the analysis, uh, we started with uh, th this uh, huge amount of data that we had, uh, and we tried to extrapolate some insights. Uh, and our goal uh, was really to um, try to find uh, some directions for design uh, to generate new ideas and ad hoc solutions for uh, people who were going through the lockdown and were living the pandemic at the moment. Uh, so we found some preliminary insights. So we ran a, a more uh, quantitative analysis at the beginning. And uh, right away, like, just uh, a few days after the survey we collected a huge amount of data already um, we started to publish and to share the results and as you can see here these are very uh, quick visualizations of the emotions that we, people uh, were feeling at the moment and this is uh, related to italy only uh, so you can see also uh, the emotions uh, split by age groups and how different age uh, uh, groups are, are reacting uh, to to the pandemic at to the lockdown. Uh, but then we also ran a different kind of analysis, which is more uh, in depth and it's uh, more qualitative because we had also a lot of open ended questions. Uh, so we had huge amounts of text uh, uh, to analyze them in order to find out uh, how people were uh, reacting and uh, how they were feeling. Uh, so, in order to do this, we couldn't do that manually because we wanted to gather some results as soon as possible. So, we applied some natural language processing techniques. Uh, so some AI to the analysis of uh, these uh, uh, big amounts of uh, text. And we identified the keywords and topics that were related to the questions that we were asking. Uh, and we're basically analyzing the people's problems and needs and emotions. And for instance, what you can see here is the one visualizations referring to uh, what makes people feel good. And uh, this again related to uh, results from Italy. And we got the keywords directly from the text and then we grouped them in uh, um, level topics and that was done manually. But the interesting thing is that uh, based, in, based, from, uh, based on the data that we collected through the survey in different countries, we can also uh, analyze and compare the results uh, and what came out uh, uh, in different populations. So here you can see a comparison between Italy and Wales. Uh, for which in both countries we got in the end about 2,000 responses to our survey. Uh, and he, it's interesting to see some differences in how people uh, reacted uh, to this situation. So in particular, when we asked them what uh, was making them feel good, despite all the difficulties of the moment, uh, you can see that uh, the loved ones or family friends uh, had a bigger, um, a bigger weight in Italy versus Brazil while the concept of interacting with people was more important in Brazil than in Italy. Uh, but there were also some results that are, were really uh, culture related, like the love for music uh, in Brazil, uh, which was not present at all in Italy. Although they were singing from the balcony and uh, we know probably that story, uh, but still it, it's interesting. And another result that we got when we asked them what the people were most afraid of in that situation, uh, it's striking to see uh, not only that the concept of, of, of uncertainty is very uh, different, it's quite different from between Italy and Brazil, and it's more important in Italy, but what is really striking is the concept of death and uh, uh, the weight that it has uh, in Brazil versus uh, uh, in Italy, and that also reflects probably a situation that uh, was more, more scary in a country versus another. So this is just that the preliminary analysis that we ran and we are working on publishing results also from other countries. Uh, but then what we did uh, after extrapolating the res these results uh, was uh, jumping to the, to the design phase. So we really wanted to create an act based on the data that we had collected and we wanted to help designers uh, uh, find directions to, to face uh, this, uh, this emergency through design solutions. Uh, so we thought about this platform as a repository of uh, ideas uh, that were going to be shared in an open way and in a free way so that everyone could build on them and uh, um, create an impact uh, by making them real. Uh, but also we wanted to use this platform to generate ideas and to uh, create a community of designers that could really collaborate uh, on these topics. So we uh, 
performed two different activities in parallel. One was uh, open design challenges, and we uh, launched a few challenges uh, through our platform to designers all over the world. But we also ran specific focus design workshops with some partners in order to gather a good number of ideas uh, to start with. And these are uh, the partners that we involved uh, at the, the beginning of our process. So some are from uh, Italy, from Milan, but others are from the US uh, and others from Brazil. So we really ran different kinds of activities also um, tailored to the, the partner that we were involved in. And then we started to share these ideas on our platform. We collected uh, now about 60 ideas that are clustered into four categories and we clustered them in order to make them more understandable and uh, uh, also more approachable by designers. So here you can see the four different areas. One is uh, ideas about physical safety. Another one is projects about mental health and well-being. And then we have the category uh, related to shared experiences. So sharing and living something together, but also entertainment um, is, uh, is falling in this, in this category. And then the final one was community support, because many of these ideas were focusing on uh, helping uh, people uh, through the community uh, and uh, building communities that could uh, help people face these uh, challenges. Um, so once we had this design platform, uh, we realized that, of course, the emergency was not over, but also we couldn't probably call it an emergency anymore uh, because it was going to be something that uh, probably would have lasted longer than we expected. Um, and we also wanted to somehow challenge, uh, challenge design to think about uh, uh, how the world was going to change and how we could use this platform to face uh, the next stages of this crisis. Um, so we also uh, try to use this, and, and this is something that is still open. So this, the platform, the platform is uh, is uh, alive now, uh, is still collecting ideas, uh, but it's more uh, has been redirected more towards uh, how we can collect solutions that can help people also recover from this or face different stages of this uh, pandemic and this situation. Um, and still, we, we had another step uh, that was mentioned at the beginning, which was the implementation. So we didn't want to leave these ideas uh, at the stage of ideas, but we wanted to try to create an impact through these uh, um, projects and the, the effort of the, the designers. Um, so we tried to find ways to develop these seed ideas uh, into something more concrete. And to do that, we also uh, tried to assess these ideas uh, around three parameters. So one was the focus. So what was the focus of the solution? And as you saw uh, previously, we identified four categories, but also what is the impact of the solution or more specifically, what phase of the crisis does it address? Is it in the emergency phase, in the transition or in what was called the new normality, the new normal or new normality? And the final uh, parameter was the effort that was required in order to implement this solution because some of them were really low tech. Some others required a lot of uh, technology and effort and uh, investment. Uh, so once we classified these, we also tried, started to get in touch with partners uh, and companies who could uh, uh, help the development and implementation of these ideas. And these are for examples of ideas that are being developed right now. Um, and I'm gonna focus on the last one in particular, uh, which is uh, Angelo. And this idea um, came out as a, a very, quite simple technical solution to face a problem, which is the one of uh, uh, elderly living in nursing homes uh, that are at, the, at that moment, uh, were finding it very difficult to communicate with their family members who are going to visit them because there was a distance uh, uh, that was mandatory to maintain of two meters or two meters and a half. Uh, and with the use of masks for elderly people who with hearing impairment, it was incredibly difficult to have a communication and a, and a conversation with their uh, loved ones. So this project came out as a, as a reaction uh, by the, the, the author, um, which is the son of this guy we see here, who is a, a 160 year old man living in a, in a nursing home in Italy. Uh, and um, basically uh, his son-in-law, 
that it would be able to make the communication easier. And he put together voice amplifier, which again, technically is quite simple, uh, but really solved the problem of uh, uh, Angel, who is the name of the, uh, the elderly person living in the nursing home. Um, so after creating this prototype, um, the, the, the author of the idea uh, got in touch with us and asked to, actually he, he uh, was trying to make this uh, real and to make this uh, up, like implemented and uh, uh, available to other nursing homes. Uh, so we tried to create a network around this idea and we involved different partners and stakeholders. Uh, there was a studio, a design studio who uh, took care of the design of the solution. And then uh, and built a prototype, and uh, we are quite uh, uh, proud right now because this solution is being developed and built by high school students in Italy uh, who are um, in an electronic and mechanical uh, high school, and being parts of Angelo putting it together and donating it to uh, nursing homes uh, in the north of Italy. So this is a success story that came out from Design for Emergency. And this is another one that uh, was actually happening in Brazil. Um, again, this, this was the part of the contest that we launched with uh, a museum in Brazil. And uh, we collected a number of ideas that were published on the platform. And this also uh, was able to, um, to create a, a network in a local network. Uh, and the company decided to sponsor the idea and to build it. Uh, and to um, share it with the local communities. And this is basically a modular sanitizer that can be worn by kids that in, where you can put a, a hand sanitizer or soap. So again, successful stories that came out of this, but I will leave the uh, stage to uh, Professor Chukari again. Okay, so to wrap up and you know to, to conclude this uh the presentation of this project you know just numbers you know <laughs> we, we know how data and figures uh doesn't re really represent you know the, the complexity of an initiatives like this but i think it gives um this slide gives um, a good idea of the engagement and the commitment of all the organization that participated so and it happened you know because I think again we, we created the condition for that and and um, we were able in a way to shape uh, you know under a constant fluid <laughs> sequence of events you know to shape the process in a way that uh, could express as much as possible the potential of design and now we have um we have a, a couple of byproducts i think that are also very interesting as i said at the beginning we that the knowledge base that all the surveys together Create. I mean, it's. Uh, I think it would be something very useful for all other kinds of research um, initiatives. So anyone working in health or uh, uh, other fields can can find relevant information in that. So that's why we are planning to release very soon <laughs> a, 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 a data platform where all the data of the survey um, and uh, can be found and 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 visualized, but also downloaded. Uh, for for further analysis, so that's it's it's kind of a byproduct of the, the main uh, uh, platform, but I think it it could be really relevant for all other kinds of initiatives. So to summarize the results, you know we have the data platform that we will we will publish hopefully soon with all the results of the analysis, the visualizations by themselves. I mean they were very useful when we had to communicate and to spread the initiative. So having uh, a good, you know, mastering those a good visual language. I think it's also some a competence that designers can bring to this kind of initiative, being able to communicate and to spread and to share. And we have this collection of steel ideas that um, can be themselves developed or can be, you know, inspiration for other projects and initiatives. We have some initiatives, some projects under development, or some have been already developed, and that's of course very good. <laughs> Especially for the ones that have a real impact in in in, in social in communities, and we have also built, you know, kind of again uh, step by step, unintentionally in a way. But now we have a, a great global network of partners that can be leveraged for maybe you know other initiatives, uh, bigger projects, grant proposals, and so that's um, that's that's also an asset that in a way has been created by the initiative. 
And at the end, there's a, a the, we we have the idea that this could be a, a, an operative model, a, a process or a platform that can be reused in other potential emergencies we, we will face in the future. Well, actually we, we aren't uh, uh, immersed in another big emergency that now it's kind of a little forgotten in the media agenda that is the climate change emergency that you know, we'll, it's there and will be with us for a long time. And that's maybe another emergent problem that we could face with a similar uh, approach. We had on a certain point also the idea to, of changing the name of the initiative itself. So you know, moving from design for emergency to design of the emergent meaning or emergent designs so and meaning working for something that is emerging from society and, and responding as fast as possible with design competencies. Um, we have some next steps, but you know, again, this is um, uh, ongoing. So the initiative is still ongoing. The, the data platform hopefully will be the, the first of these next steps, but we want to open up you know, as much as possible as we are doing with you other design challenges and gather people that wants to um, build uh, both new knowledge through the survey, but also new ideas for the repository and as much as possible, try to implement some of those um, solutions. Um, I think that's that's it. You know, the, that's the domain of the, the URL of the website and feel free to reach out for any questions. I'd like to say thank you very much then to, to Paolo and to Sarah. Uh, Paolo has to go and teach now, uh, so he can't join us in the live Q&A immediately after this, uh, but we will see you there shortly. Uh, thank you. It was a pleasure being with you and have this conversation. Bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>
with researchers that where we're, we're now globally because of the pandemic, you know, we're all having very similar experiences of lockdown and the tragedies connected with the pandemic. And so it's been, um, it's been a really eye-opening uh, experience for, for us as well. And um, thank you to Syra for her generosity of, of letting us join this project and, and be the UK partner. So yeah, so thank you, Syra. I don't often get to the opportunity to say that to you when we talk. Thanks to Rhiannon and Victoria for being great partners in this project uh, because uh, we started really small, but uh, as you've seen the video, it's, uh, this project is still growing after one year and uh, it's growing also through our collaboration with SHED. Uh, so in this sense, we would also like to encourage you to uh, be part of this uh, research and this study that we are carrying on, still carrying on, if, even if the first survey we launched the, uh, in order to better understand users and people and what was going on uh, during the pandemic was almost or basically one year ago. Yeah, almost uh, exactly one year ago. Uh, but we're still con collecting information and um, uh, we want to understand what's going on right now after this time and uh, what kind of innovations are still needed and uh, what kind of issues that people are feeling and are encountering right now. So, um, to this aim, if you would like to fill in the survey and to participate in the study, there is a link uh, in the um, platform chat, bo uh, chat box, right? Or correct me if I'm, I'm not sure exactly where it is, but I know that you can access that link. Uh, so it will be great to have your input on this. And of course, this data will be um, collected and we are building also, uh, as you probably heard from the video, a data platform to share this aggregated data. Um, so that's what we're working on, but at the same time, uh, we're working on many other initiatives uh, and one of these is a collaboration with, with SHAD and different kinds of collaborations. So uh, we'll be very uh, glad to share uh, more when, uh, when they're ready and uh, when we actually have something to, uh, to publish and to make uh, available to everyone. Fantastic. Thank you. So that's that's led me into the, the prompt I was going to give you, which is what do you want people to, to do as a result of uh, of watching this? And that is to fill in the survey, which you can find a link for in the in the platform just now. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about in some of the, the breakout space this morning and and it came up yesterday in the, the panel discussion uh, following the, the keynote is about this kind of broadening of art and design opportunities as part of education, but also just as, as part of life experience. Um, and I wondered if, if Sari, you could say a little bit more about um, how you're broadening the scope of this kind of engagement with design um, as part of the design for emergency. I think there's, there are particular countries and partners that, that you're working with more recently that, that broaden that from just university education. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, we just uh, started a collaboration with uh, our Austrian partner. Uh, and uh, in this sense, we have uh, we are starting a series of workshops with high school students. So students that are a bit younger than university students that we are already involved in other activities. Uh, and I think it's going to be very intriguing and uh, interesting, maybe also challenging to see how we can involve uh, younger people in thinking about uh, innovation and design in this context. So we'll follow a similar process uh, uh, for the ideation of new services that can respond to the needs of people uh, in this moment. And this will be based on the data we are collecting in Austria. So this is a brand new activity that we have just launched. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we are really excited to see the results and how they can fit in the larger picture of design for emergency. Uh, so this also connects to the question that I uh, see in the chat box about uh, how governments can, um, can play a role in this. And I mm. think this is an example of how uh, the Ministry of Education is funding some uh, activities uh, uh, in order to respond to this crisis. Uh, so this is part of it. We have applied and we got fund uh, for to, to perform these activities. There are more examples, uh, but I would like to. Uh, Good. Have, well, I'm, uh, sure we, I'm sure we will come to them uh, later on in the conversation. But just on that point about uh, engaging with uh, with national or with with local government and other kind of actors and agencies. Um, it brings to mind some of the, the discussions that we've had previously, Rhiannon, about the, the civic agenda and the role of the university in its local community. And do you want to say a little bit more about that in relation to, to this work and to SHED? 
Yeah, I, I think it's 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 really interesting in terms of thinking about um, at the University of Derby and its civic agenda and it's really championing and pushing forward um, social mobility agenda. And I know that Shed has kind of uh, been very fortunate to be embraced by a lot of the cultural and civic partners and networks and venues across Derby um, to kind of work with them and their agendas of change. Um, and how we can work together to close the gap. And, and it really strikes me that it's about um, creating spaces. And we've talked, we've talked about that a few times today already about how we can work more interdisciplinarily, how we can try to open the doors of the university and go out into the city and to engage with the communities and also the communities that perhaps we don't know who we desperately need to be connecting with. And I think a project like this um, this research project was really interesting for SHED because it's another way in which we can create opportunities for conversations with the public about art and design innovation and through the guise, you know, of, of doing hosting workshops or whether it's we connect with some of the other, you know, um, design for emergency partners. So, Syra, just while we were waiting to come live, we were talking about what's happening in Brazil at the moment. And we we're talking about Austria and we were saying, you know, if we give the blueprints of Shed to those partners and they set up the Shed as a working space to think through some of these research themes and ideas you know, not only will that be really interesting for us, for our research about how we design spaces for conversation, but also how it aids research and the public discourse and engagement with art and design education. Because I think we need to be thinking about that, how we, how we, as we mentioned yesterday in the panel, how we can, you know, how we can champion um, the creative subjects and, and the contribution that they make across uh, the you know social policy economy that we we contribute in many ways to many different uh, areas of business and we need to kind of celebrate that uh, and and open um, opportunities for people to engage with conversations with us about art and design education um, whether that's in a formal way whether it's in the school playground looking at an object you know we need to be able to. Um, champion and push forward these conversations because those young people that engage with projects like this and, and then find out that they're engaging with you know a global research project may well then start to get intrigued in the idea of coming later in life and studying a subject and studying the discipline so it's, it's very much about you know championing and safeguarding the subject but also extending the reach and the possibility for it as well and I think that's what's really exciting and what drew Shed to wanting to be a part of this global partnership. And and so what to stick with with you for a minute Rihanna what what is it that you think uh, is meaningful at that local level and how do we start to have those conversations without putting smaller or um, marginalised communities or audiences off by saying this is part of a global challenge and, and the bigger picture? How do we actually get in there on the ground and start that conversation? I think it's black, you know, it's these terms that we hear a lot, you know, around the kind of co-creative approach and, um, and also what Floella said, play. You know the playfulness of it. I mean, you know what in our in our experience, you know, if a van turns up and these panels are being taken off the back of it, and and this thing, this object's being drilled and constructed, you know, people automatically creates a temporal space for conversation, uh, curiosity. Uh, you know, what is it? What's it for? What's it doing? So it's not so much that we have to say, you know, the big the big kind of oh, this is a you know, a global research, but we don't have to say that line. It's just about kind of, you know, we're here to have a chat. And I think it's really important that the community take ownership about that, about the configuration that shed, you know, take the shape and form it takes, but also the activity that then takes place in it. So it might be that some of the, you know, we're going to be working closely with Paolo and with Syrah to say, OK, so what are some of the innovations that have happened in Italy, for example? You know, oh, that might actually work really well in Leeds, where we're going next month. And we can take that object and we can have feedback conversation into a workshop we're doing with older people there around loneliness. And we can think about, you know, so it's about how we can tailor activities and also make sure that we're then really appropriately talking about the different innovations and models and designs that have been created in this project 
and linking them together. So it's having that blended, cohesive approach to it as well, but in real world context. And so, Sarah, can you say a bit more about, we, we had a bit of a glimpse um, in the, the pre-recorded segment about uh, the, the types of activities that are that are there on that platform and the challenges that have been posed. Are some of those getting more traction than others? Are they more popular? Are there, are there things that you want to point people to that, that seem to be quite sticky and difficult problems? Or is it a balance across the, the piece for you? Well, I think in terms of the activities right now, the ideation phase is a bit uh, has been a bit on hold uh, for until this uh, uh, recent workshop that we have started, because we have tried to focus more on implementing some of the ideas that uh, had been shared on the platform. Uh, so that was our main focus uh, more recently. Uh, and these activities are very local, uh, I have to say. So I think they. Um, marry the shared philosophy very well because uh, we are a global initiative uh, but in the end all the solutions need to be tailored to uh, a local uh, um, context so this is what's happening and uh, we've been quite busy following the development of Angelo which is a solution that has been uh, uh, mentioned uh, in the pre-recorded session and uh, that solution is actually um, has seen the involvement of high schools, but professional schools uh, this time, where students uh, were uh, uh, invited to build this uh, product. So this is actually happening and we have nursing homes that are ready to take these uh, products and use them. Um, so it's very nice to see that there was really close uh, correlation with local entities and uh, local schools. Uh, uh, I have to say it's quite challenging, uh, but this is getting a lot of attention and traction in Italy. Uh, but at the same time that uh, the same product uh, was brought also to the Netherlands and there there were different needs because of different, uh, different contexts. So we're trying to adapt it to the needs of uh, uh, daily uh, centers for elderly people uh, that struggle to communicate to each other because of the distance. So we're trying to adapt that product there. Uh, so that that these are the activities that we are mainly focusing right now. Uh, but of course, like this is just one part of it, and we are also uh, very glad to involve other disciplines uh, and uh, to work more on the data um, section. So we use this data to other uh, like for other goals, and um, also how to involve artists, for instance. So how can we build something through artists through other creative disciplines? Uh, um, on the data that we have collected. So this yeah, is yeah that, I mean that strikes me as something that uh, we talked before about the fact that that's um, that's part of the uniqueness and the the added value of this particular project. Designers think like this and work like this and respond rapidly to challenges that are put in front of them as a matter of course, uh, and that's built into the discipline of, of education around the. Um, the art and design subjects, but I think the the use of data at this scale as well is is particularly new and um, and obviously very relevant at the moment. And um, what's the the timetable for you for the for the data side of things? When will you be able to to share that with people? Yeah, we're almost done with the platform. At least a first batch of data uh, will probably be released in the next month. And um, we have, of course, different countries uh, are working at different speed on these projects. Uh, so we won't have complete data for all the countries that we have involved, but at least all the quantitative data will be published. Um, and then the analysis of the topics that's, that takes more time, it's a bit more difficult. So it might take longer for some countries, uh, but we're, we're gonna have a first version soon. Yeah. Excellent. And Rhiannon, can I uh, ask you to pick up on, on something that Sarah was just saying there about the um, the cross-disciplinary working outside art and design subjects as well? Because I know that Shed's worked with, with social science and, and I'm, I'm of that school myself. But do you want to say a little bit more about interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary approaches? Yeah, um, yeah, I think that um, one of the things that we're going to be modeling and, and trying out as part of this research project is offering a series of micro residences in shed in different cities that we tour to, where we can have musicians, artists, designers, architects, theatre makers, um, social scientists, um, you, you know, so we, we're going to be basically offering those opportunities to try to then get completely fresh perspectives 
on some of these innovations and some of the data that, that's coming through. And I think that's really exciting for us because that's another fundamental part of what Shed's about, which is about it being an accessible space that's open for everybody to engage with. So what we're hoping is that, you know, we can, we can really demonstrate practically our ethos and our approach of being, um, you know, very kind of multi-interdisciplinary -inter in, in, in how we, we operate. And it strikes me that, you know, if there are questions or, or um, data that, that would be interesting to have a UK perspective on, you know, um, that, that we can offer that, we can do that and we can, um, we can draw those connections maybe. And, you know, it'd be really interesting, like you're saying, Sarah, that if, you know, if we give a, a, a certain object uh, or, or um, uh, data modeling that's been con conducted in another country, but also by someone from a certain discipline and give it to someone from another place with a, with a different discipline as a specialism, what might that do you know and I think that's what's really exciting um, for us as well. We've um, we've talked uh, earlier this morning and in, in our previous conversations about different sort of scales of, of, uh, of learning and, and collaboration whether that's very local or whether it's it's national or European or international as in in this case and um, Sarah do you do you have any kind of um, interesting anecdotes or stories to share about uh, ways that you've really found it useful to work with uh, with policymakers or sort of non-design uh, educators or practitioners in completely different disciplines to make this uh, successful response to a challenge? Well, we had quite some multidisciplinary collaboration at the at the beginning of the of the process and the project, uh, especially on the data analysis. So uh, we, we had to collaborate with people from uh, uh, AI, for instance, uh, and uh, data scientists uh, to try to get in, dig into our data as soon as possible, as fast as possible, and collect uh, feedback and input uh, that could be useful for designers. Uh, so we had involved different uh, stakeholders and actors uh, in this. And uh, right now, for instance, our uh, the, the example I was mentioning about uh, the, the workshops in Austria, uh, we are collaborating with a partner, uh, which is a um, social uh, entity and it's not, it's, it's a non-profit. So uh, we are actually involving again, other kinds of stakeholders that don't have a design background, come from different disciplines, uh, uh, but we're trying to build something together, also involving uh, uh, the government. So that's very exciting. Uh, and in other contexts, uh, it was, probably mainly connected to the design discipline itself. Uh, mm -hmm. But there are also examples of uh, going really out of our boundaries uh, and uh, involving other kinds of figures. Yeah, sure. I mean, for me, certainly, there's there's so much just within this project and the examples that we've only briefly touched on about kind of the, the value of design as a practice and design as a discipline and how we educate people and inspire them to, to solve challenges. Uh, we've certainly talked about some of that in the breakout space which is going to be open again this afternoon and we'd really like to see as many of you as possible in there to, to carry on this conversation whether that's about using studio space or taking studio space out to the city to engage people um, or whether it's about policy and and more strategic questions um, at that higher level in education but we are just about out of time on this one so I will say thanks again to Rhiannon and I will say thanks again to Sarah and to Paolo, who can't be with us just now. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us. And I hope that uh, you can join us again later in the breakout session with the virtual shed. Thank you.